Sarah, you're on mute. Yep, I just noticed that. <laughs> Thank you. Can you see the slides right now? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, yes, it looks I, like we have the slides up now. Great. Thank you for that. I, I believe this is me sharing, though. I don't know that yes. Jane can join on, so I can advance the slides as you need it. OK, great. Could you move to the um, third one with the agenda? Yeah, so today we'll be discussing the need to protect tenants from radon, hearing about some example policies in Montgomery County, Maryland, and Illinois, as well as HUD's multifamily lending programs, discussing how change happens and opportunities for action, and then we'll end with a 15-minute Q&A. As I mentioned earlier, you can put your questions in the chat throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get to as many as we can um, at the end after the presentations. Uh, next slide. So my name is Sarah Goodwin. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at NCEHH, and I coordinate the National Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition. Our speakers today are Jane Malone, who's the National Policy Director of the Indoor Environment Association, formerly known as ARST, um, Daisy Rosendi, who is with Smart Home Inspects and is the president of the Maryland chapter of the Indoor Environment Association, Dan Potter, who is with DuPage Radon and president of the Midwest Indoor Environment Association, Kyle Hoenland, who is the CEO of Protect Environmental and President of the Indoor Environments Association, and Allison Thornton, who is the Executive Director of Lung Cancer Connection of Missouri. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers today. Um, Jane, yeah. are you available to? Uh, I, I'm back. Talk? Okay. All right. Um, I'll Thank pass you. it to you then to continue on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so yes, we're here to talk about setting the context, the urgent need to protect tenants from radon. Uh, I'm sure that lots of people in this call share the viewpoint that we need to protect tenants. We're gonna go through some background. First of all, our main objective today is to learn about public policy options to protect tenants from radon. Although there are other ways to help tenants, our discussion today was pretty much gonna focus on policy. <clears throat> Every, I'm sorry, um, can you advance the slide? Um, Every every 25 minutes, Randy's lung cancer claims another victim in our country. This costs 5.9 million in medical coverage, as well as 6.2 billion in economic costs, including lost productivity. <clears throat> Radon is a radioactive cancer-causing gas. It's invisible, odorless, and tasteless. 21,000 plus annual radon-induced lung cancer deaths each year. The leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers the leading environmental cause of cancer mortality. More than one in three homes has high radon levels. <clears throat> and we know that from the CDC Environmental Public Health Tracking Network Data Explorer. Um, and the, here you see on your screen, the picture of a map from Data Explorer that tells us where is there a high risk of radon? Well, contrary to the belief that high radon levels are only found in some areas or something called EPA radon zones, it's everywhere. This map shows us that radon above the action level has been found in at least one home in every one of the counties that are shaded in red. <clears throat> and in many of the other counties that are not shaded in red on your map, you see that there has been little hash marks, the, the diagonal black line, or no, the gray color testing. And note that more indicators um, regarding radon, um, including the proportion of homes that have high radon in each county, <coughs> That, that data could also be found through Data Explorer, as well as data for New Jersey and Kansas, which in fact do have homes with high radon levels, just not uh, represented in the data set, the data set that generated this map. So how does this radon get from being in your county and your neighborhood? How does it get into your home? It enters buildings typically through the soil. It gravitates indoors since the pressure inside a structure is lower than the pressure in the soil. <coughs> Radon levels tend to be highest in the lowest habitable area of a building, which is why we test there first. Sometimes high radon is found at a higher level due to peripheral pathways or other factors. And one important point, building age does not affect the likelihood of high radon levels. It's been found in very old homes and in brand new homes. And if you look to the right side of the graphic, you can see some of the pathways through construction joints, cavities and cracks inside walls, cracks in solid floors, gaps around service pipes, and gaps in suspended floors, as well as coming in for private wells and groundwater supplies. And how's radon get from the building into your body? It comes in through your lungs when you inhale, when you breathe. It comes in through a quite natural process that we need to do to stay alive every second of every day, which is breathing. 
And the particles um, that are coming in that contain radon are radioactive. These can and do damage DNA, increasing the risk of lung cancer. And so the risk factors uh, include co the radon concentration, meaning the, hot, the radon level in the home, exposure, meaning time spent indoors in that building, and also smoking, which does increase risk of radon-induced lung cancer. So why act? We're basically talking about gaining some health equity for tenants. For quite some time, the uh, radon preventive prevention movement in the U.S. has been focused on owner-occupied homes, which is very important. But we need to focus more intensely and sooner on radon risk for tenants. Exposure to radon is a very serious habitability issue. Lung cancer typically leads to death within five years. The owner of rental property, who typically doesn't also occupy the building, has power over decisions about mitigating. Renters are more likely to be low income. Improper characterization of, characterization of radon risk by neglecting to test all ground contact units is causing health and safety current concerns. Other problems are perceived as more immediate priority, heat, hot water, mold, pests. These are all things you can see uh, or feel. You can feel the cold, you can feel the lack of hot water, um, but radon is the one that actually um, is causing death at high numbers. So um, in the questions, uh, thank, thanks to all who submitted questions in the uh, sign up for this webinar. And um, a number of people asked questions about what can you, uh, do we do outside the policy framework? So I just wanted to review briefly self-protective actions for tenants. The one thing tenants can do is test. Now there are some exceptions, uh, supposedly in some states, you're not supposed to test your own unit if you, you know, based on some state regulations. Um, but um, the way to test is to purchase a test kit or obtain a free one, one from your state radon program. State radon programs typically have them, at least some of them, in January during National Radon Action Month. They don't necessarily have an unlimited supply all year round. Be sure to follow the directions on the kit. kit. Don't delay in mailing the device back to the lab. Or you can hire a radon professional to test. Look up your state radon program and check its website or find a certified measurement professional at NRPP or NRSB. If the radon level is above four, inform the landlord, provide a copy of the radon test result, request mitigation. If the landlord is unresponsive, consider seeking help, code enforcement, or court action. That said, you know, there are responsible landlords who, when notified about a, a hazard or risk to life in the building that they're renting out, they might well act. So it's not, uh, we don't assume that no landlords out there will respond. Um, some of them don't know about radon any more than the tenant does. And so we need to be educating landlords as well as tenants. Also encourage your neighbors to test. Um, perhaps more than one test result in the building might make the difference in, um, in terms of the landlord being aware of the problem and being willing to address it and evaluate your options. <clears throat> Testing is the only way to know if a building has excessive radon. The US EPA action level is for picocuries. It was never a health-based standard. When created in the 1980s, four was considered the lowest level achievable by mitigation. Survey results more than 30 years later indicate the average radon level achieved by mitigators is 1.5 picocuries. So 36% of US homes have radon levels above four, 61% um, have radon levels above two, which includes the above 36%, of course, no level of exposure to radon is safe. So we're going to go into policy examples now. I just wanted to give you this overview <clears throat> of radon policies for rental housing. Um, this is um, not a lot of policies. They all fit on one slide is the first thing I would note. So the first issue we have is scalability. You know, do, do we have an, enough policy making conversation going on, the answer to that is no, which is why we're here today. So the and this these policies are somewhat along a continuum. First of all, tenant awareness and notification. These policies exist statewide in Colorado and Illinois. The tenants can test and they can end the lease without financial penalty. Test units, um, Boulder County, Colorado uh, requires testing every five years for short term rentals. Maine required testing of all units in the state within one year of enactment, which was 10 years ago, 2014. 
Test units and mitigate if the radon result is above four. This is somewhat stronger than the one above. And we have that policy in Iowa City, Iowa for single family and duplex housing. And we also have that in the National Healthy Housing Standard, which is available through the National Center for Healthy Housing. Pre-occupancy test result of radon above four, South Brunswick, New Jersey, Montgomery County, Maryland, Rockville, Maryland. And finally, building wine testing, which is uh, from is is a, a policy enacted by both HUD FHA and FHFA. So the next three speakers are going to talk about these policies. Um, first, we're going to have Daisy Resende. Next slide, talk about Montgomery County, Maryland. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for for being here today. Um, so. Most of you know that Montgomery County is home to more than a million persons and about a third of the residential dwelling inventory in our county um, are rental units. In 2015, Council Member Rice uh, passed a law um, to require testing before a home is sold. And in 2022, he introduced another legislation and passed unanimously uh, in the Council requiring that all new and renewal leases be tested for radon and mitigated if levels were above four picocuries per liter. And uh, the test must be performed by a professional, uh, by a professional radon uh, person and the mitigation as well. Now, um, the law applies to all multifamily and single family and um, it applies to ground contact. Um, and this is for all new leases after July 1st, 2023 and renewals. Um, next slide, please. So the landlord must provide to the tenant the radon test and the test must be below four or they need to mitigate the property. Um, if if they don't, the tenant has a way to um, move out and have no financial penalties with it. There must be a retest every three years. Um, and um, next one, please. So any existing uh, tenants can test their units. Um, they can contact the landlords and require the landlords to test. And um, the, the landlords have 90 days um, to perform mitigation if it's above four picocuries. So far, we have not seen any delays on implementing the legislation. Uh, we have not seen um, any shortage on certified professionals to do that or the timeframes that are needed for, for this. Um, lay, uh, tenants can test themselves or they can hire somebody to, to test the units, but landlords must provide a professional test to everybody. Next slide, please. And uh, the good thing about the, that the tenants being able to have their own tests done to purchase a kit and do this is to alert everybody and just to ensure that the landlords are, you know, doing what needs to be done. It's the opportunity to take a self-protective action if it's needed. Um, now, just on a side note, the Maryland Real Estate Commission has expressed interest in replicating both the buyer and the tenant protection uh, policies statewide. And um, our next presenter, uh, Dan Potter, will talk a little bit more about Illinois. Hello everyone, <clears throat> my name is Dan Potter. I have a radon mitigation company and I volunteer within the Indoor Environments Radon Trade Association. And I lead a group that I formed called the Illinois Radon Policy Task Force. Last year, this group got a law passed in Illinois that gave awareness and options to tenants regarding radon in their building. Uh, by the way, a similar law uh, also was passed last year in Colorado, as uh, Jane had mentioned. The Illinois law does a few things. It requires the landlord or property manager show any previous radon test reports for that building to all new tenants and lease renewers. 
It also requires that the landlord or property manager uh, show an online pamphlet about radon to all new tenants and lease renewers. Um, actually, can you go to the next slide? There we are. Um, it allows a tenant to test for radon with either a home test or a professional. And it allows the landlord or property manager to then verify that test with a professional test. For buildings that fail to test, the landlord can mitigate or not mitigate as they choose. But if they decide not to mitigate, the tenant can leave the lease without any penalty. So this keeps the tenant from being stuck in a radioactive apartment. Uh, next slide. So to give you a feel for the process, two years ago, I unsuccessfully tried to get this bill through the General Assembly, uh, which is what we call, what they call nationally, the Congress. Um, understand that in Illinois, it's very easy to get a bill started, but very, very hard to get it through the process within the five month window that they give you. Only about 6% of bills typically become a law. So last year we assembled an even bigger task force, this time of about 30 people with five nonprofit affiliate groups uh, connected with us, including the Indoor Environments uh, Group and the American Lung Association. We broke the task force into teams based on interests of the, of the um, task force members. Um, we then assign tasks to those teams. Uh, but for instance, people who are uncomfortable um, reaching out to people might be on our research team or our strategic team. Those who were comfortable doing outreach might be on our legislative outreach or even on our affiliate outreach team. Um, we also developed fact sheets, uh, email templates and other standardized documents, including a couple videos and instruction lists. Uh, we use these when we ask task force members to contact legislators or, or potential affiliates to ask for their support. We built an online portal where task force members could get those instructions um, and in, uh, supporting documents that I mentioned. Uh, we built a tracking mechanism to track all legislative and affiliate outreach actions. Uh, the outreach we use that we're talking about here is mostly via phone calls or emails, uh, but we also did have a field team who met with legislators in person down at the Capitol. In the end, this task force achieved over 900 interactions of some kind with legislators. We secured 32 senators and representatives to be co-sponsors of the bill, and it passed the General Assembly in May and was signed by the governor a few months later. Uh, next slide. So uh, I have never done anything like this in my past. So there were a lot of lessons I learned. Uh, and here are a few. Uh, first off, anyone can do this. Um, that being said, the more people is more better. Um, <laughs> even if you only get a few more people than you, it's just much better than trying to do this on your own. Um, you also don't have to have a background or knowledge of politics. You just have to be persistent. That being said, studying the process in your state or whatever it is, your town or county or wherever you're trying to make the change, um, do that. Study the process so you know the game you're playing. Uh, most of the time that information is available somewhere online. Um, if not, you can start calling government agencies and asking questions on how does that process work. Uh, another thing I learned is that early in the process, think about what groups might be in favor of your bill. So they might be governmental agencies, trade associations, nonprofits, health groups, et cetera, and reach out to them and ask them to support the bill as best they can. We call those groups affiliates. Most affiliates have few resources they're willing to add beyond you using their logo in your literature, but even doing that is helpful because it conveys to legislators that whole groups are behind this policy change. And you never know what else they might do. We got free help from one of the affiliates um, lobbyists. So um, 
Likewise, think about what groups might oppose it and make a decision. Do you want to reach out to them early and start negotiating with them? Or do you want to uh, delay that so you don't give them as much time to organize their opposition? Um, we ended up doing a little bit of both with the Illinois Realtors Association, who we did not alert early, but later they behind the scenes stopped our bill uh, and forced us to nego negotiate some points with them. But I think because of this huge outreach program, they were willing to negotiate because they saw the high level of public support that was against them. So um, also prior to making big decisions, we leaned on the advice of Jane Malone, the policy director for indoor environments and on our lobbyists. Um, also remember that few legislators or groups are ever want to be on record as being against new policies that protect people from radioactive radon. So policy changes are unlikely to be publicly opposed or voted down, but they might stall behind the scenes. So it's helpful to have great communication with those people who can see what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, and the last point is don't let perfection get in the way of doing more. Uh, you'll make mistakes just like we did. Uh, but doing more actions can easily make up for any missteps. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Kyle Hoylman from Protect Environmental. He's also the president of Indoor Environments Association, and he'll speak on HUD multifamily lending and building wide testing. Thanks, Dan. Hey, folks, uh, Kyle Hoylman with Protect Environmental and I sit and work out of our headquarters in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm happy to be here today uh, to talk about uh, more of a building wide policy or, or what policy makes sense to, to um, implement uh, if, if in fact uh, radon testing is, is required in, in your jurisdiction. Uh, next slide, please. So as Daisy and Dan have uh, provided examples of, uh, we have Montgomery County, Maryland, local jurisdictional countywide policy that, that would mandate testing. Uh, whereas we have a state policy in Illinois that Dan previewed that provides that notification and disclosure to tenants and gives them uh, remedies if elevated concentrations or the building characterizes with radon potential and uh, is not mitigated uh, by, by the landlord. Uh, those are, are two good examples of, of local and statewide policies, uh, but the vast majority of multifamily or, or tenant occupied testing that takes place in our country is actually re a result of multifamily lenders, uh, HUD and Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, which, which operate under uh, the, the jurisdiction of Federal Housing Finance Agency. Uh, th those groups are in receivership right now. Uh, there is a large uh, discrepancy between the two policies. So I think it's important to understand uh, which each uh, policy covers and um, and also the health equity considerations and the liability that that come through some of the, uh, the policy gaps. Uh, what we have here um, are just those testing policies. Quick overview, um, HUD, which has been uh, around since 2013 with this particular policy, I think we're on the third version of the policy. Uh, HUD started at 25% ground contact testing uh, after several years uh, of data, uh, which we'll get into a little of that. Uh, the policy was updated in 2016 and then again uh, in 2020 to include 100% um, ground contact, 10% upper level uh, testing. Uh, within Fannie and Freddie, uh, the policy that we're currently working under became effective on July 1 of just this last year, 2023. Uh, the previous policy was 10% of uh, ground contact units or one per building. The updated policy is 25% uh, property wide with at least one per building. Uh, so you can see that there's a discrepancy there and we'll, we'll talk about that discrepancy here in just a moment and, and the impact on liability and health equity. The testing standard within HUD is uh, just the uh, industry EPA recognized voluntary consensus standards, which are uh, ANSI R standards for multifamily buildings. Uh, if, if it would be a portfolio of single family buildings in, in the community, uh, it, it would just follow the appropriate standard. Uh, whereas within Fannie and Freddie, 
of the policy is actually written in, into the guidance, and it's very limited uh, in scope. Uh, things like quality assurance, making sure that we're not dealing with false positives, false negatives, uh, making sure that uh, that the building is mitigated and not the proper, uh, not the unit within the building. Uh, those things are actually covered in policy, but um, as as I think you'll see, may not be adequate protection for for tenants. Uh, the testing must be performed by a uh, professional if it's a HUD project uh, who is qualified, qualified being defined as certified by one of the two EPA recognized proficiency programs. Those are the National Rate on Safety Board and the National Rate on Proficiency Program and not or, but and uh, when applicable, also state licensed. Whereas Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, use a, a, a definition of environmental professional under uh, the circle of rule, which specifically excludes radiation, just as a, a point of clarification. Uh, but what this means is uh, the environmental professional, um, in their opinion, um, and, and oftentimes would not have uh, adequate knowledge or skill set to make these determinations, has been empowered to make those uh, determinations on rate on uh, characterization of, of properties through uh, the through the Fannie and, and, and Freddie policy. If testing determines that mitigation is required uh, to, to, to effectively mitigate occupant exposure within HUD, you are actually mitigating the building. Uh, so it's not OK to go in and test a unit in the building, find out that that unit has an issue, uh, only fix or mitigate that that unit and walk away, uh, leaving others in, in the building uh, at exposure uh, or at risk for radon exposure. Uh, that <clears throat> that would um, create a, a health equity uh, issue, uh, which is what we see with with the Fannie Freddie policy. Uh, Fannie Freddie is just simply test the unit, fix the unit. So if you had 25% uh, of the units in a building that required uh, testing and one of those units came back and you had 10 ground contact units, you've tested three, you've met the threshold. The requirement would be to fix the one unit. It doesn't matter what the levels were in the other seven units, it's not covered in the policy. Uh, we're leaving people behind uh, to be exposed to this radioactive gas by following that policy. And then from a mitigation standpoint, uh, the mitigation must be conducted by uh, with HUD, again, NRPP, NRSB, EPA recognized proficiency program, qualified professional and state license when applicable. Uh, and uh, within Fannie and Freddie, it's, it's uh, certified or qualified, uh, but we haven't really seen what the definition of that, that means. It's a qualified radon professional. Uh, to me, qualified as best practice would be uh, simply lean on the EPA proficiency programs, uh, but that's not, not clear in the guidance. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, diving in a little more into the health equity, uh, the liability side of things, you know, why why are we testing 100 percent of, of of HUD projects insured through it through its MAP program, its its multifamily housing program versus 25 uh, percent uh, on on the uh, uh, Fannie Freddie side? Uh, a lot of this is data driven. So HUD funded a, um, a project several years ago through the New York uh, State Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Mike Keto was the lead on this, and it, and it looked to take up that, um, that question. At the time, uh, HUD was using 25% guidance, and they simply wanted to know, does the data actually support uh, moving toward a more protective policy by requiring 100% for uh, characterization of buildings? And what we've, we found at least to the answer to one of these questions is that yes, it does matter. So what is the average probability if you're using a sampling approach? And I just wanna say from a sampling standpoint, the big difference, uh, many of you on, on the call may be involved with maintenance or uh, uh, EHS uh, facility uh, guidance within your properties. And so you may be asking, well, what about asbestos? We only, we only sample for asbestos or what about lead-based paint? Uh, we only swab one out of every 10 window sills in a, in a property. And, and that's adequate to characterize the potential for those man-made materials. And that's the difference here that, that we're dealing with. Uh, Mother Nature doesn't care that one unit in a property may have a problem and the other unit doesn't. It's the preferential pathway, it's the source under the building, and it's how the occupants may be using that building. Maybe one occupant likes it a little warmer than the other, 
now you're sucking uh, a little a little more on that particular unit. Uh, pathways being the same, uh, radon may be an issue in, in the unit that, uh, that that's using that because of the thermal stack effect and, and the mechanical induced stack effect than the exact uh, adjacent um, unit that's just used a little differently. So what, what we found in looking at this study is that using uh, the old guidance of 10%, so you'll see here the guide uh, number of ground contact units in the building ranging from five to six up to uh, 21 to 26, um, how many buildings were in the study. So you've got a pretty statistically significant representation of multifamily buildings and then your probabilities. Uh, again, um, it's a, a probability for a naturally occurring contaminant, which is why we need to test 100%. You'll see here that at 25%, uh, on average, the building is mischaracterized 38% of the time, meaning if you follow that guidance, you are going to fail to identify units in the building that are exposing occupants to unsafe levels of this radioactive material. What do you have to get to to, to hit that 95% confidence interval that we look at in the environmental industry? Um, it's it's 100%. So even at 90% uh, sampling completed, uh, you, you're still running a, a probability of, of somewhere between uh, two and a half to up to 4%. Um, obviously you're taking out uh, the ground contact uh, to get to an all of 1.7, uh, but that's why the, the standards are constructed the way that they're, they're constructed. Uh, so back in uh, 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 late 2019, early 2020, um, HUD was able to take this, HUD was able to take their data set and basically make an informed data-driven decision uh, that it's in the best interest of the occupants of these buildings, that full characterization of the building, including mitigation of the full building um, is required if, if uh, identified as, as a problem. Uh, next slide, please. So along with that, uh, we were talking about these two policies, the HUD multifamily testing policy, as well as uh, the FHFA, which, which um, is, is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, is the vast uh, percentage of multifamily testing that takes place in our country. Uh, but, but you'll notice that that's about 1.4% of the total units in our country. So in any given year, we are looking at about one, a little over maybe one and a half percent of all those units. Uh, and it's because if the unit's not involved in a lending transaction, uh, then, then what is that, that guidance? What are we doing to protect those occupants? Uh, so you'll see here that um, out of 560,000 of those units, and this is using 2022 data, uh, we we are effectively addressing about 1.4% uh, of, of the total multifamily housing population in our country. Each year, uh, we're leaving uh, and continue to leave a lot of people behind. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just go to the next slide, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, Tiffany. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, what would protection policies look like uh, if you're taking the local jurisdictional uh, that that uh, Daisy mentioned, the statewide uh, that Dan mentioned, and then looking at uh, the lending. Uh, first thing, a personal observation of mine is reliance on lending transactions to initiate these policies, to initiate these testing. As as we've seen, um, it's it's problematic because we're we're only getting a, a certain percentage of uh, these buildings. That's 1.4 percent or so per year of of, of uh, total units. Uh, so at that rate, it, it would take us quite some time to actually get to a threshold that, that's meaningful. Improved policies should protect all building occupants, regardless of the loan status. So just because you're living in a building uh, that happened to be financed and, and uh, insured through HUD's multifamily policy, um, what if you're not? Uh, you, you could be exposed, and uh, we, we just see that as a health equity issue. Uh, we, we should be ensuring that all occupants in these buildings are afforded a, a healthy, um, safe, and, and clean air environment uh, to, to be breathing, not just a certain percentage of, of uh, one or the other based on uh, the, the fact that they live in a, in a HUD uh, building or a Fannie building or a private equity building. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, buildings are actually transacted in the United States uh, that don't meet any of the, the two lending criterias. Improved policies 
should focus on requiring all tenant occupied buildings to be characterized for radon potential. Uh, and that's that's um, really what we're here today to talk about is what's the, the, the effective, the most effective and efficient means of getting to that policy, which is um, equal occupant protection of, of these buildings. And um, we may find that these policies may be best implemented at uh, the local jurisdiction, as in um, Montgomery County, Maryland, could be a state um, or, or could be federal guidance. Uh, we're, we're now starting to see um, movement in all of those areas, as we've talked about previously today. Uh, but the bottom line is all, all tenant occupied buildings, all tenant occupied units in the United States uh, should, should um, be properly characterized for radon potential, just like they are for things like uh, fire suppression systems, the regular inspections that go on there. Uh, just like these other um, uh, important public issues, public health issues that are out there, we think that that radon should be treated the, the same way. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Allison Thornton. Allison is the executive director with the Lung Cancer Connection in Missouri. Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here with you today. I'm here to speak with you today about efforts that are happening in Missouri. Um, next slide, please. So Lung Cancer Connection is a very small nonprofit based in St. Louis, Missouri, really focused on supporting lung cancer patients that are newly diagnosed. But we also understand there's a tremendous need for prevention. And through our efforts through the years, we became very aware that radon was a, a big issue in our state. Um, and so instead of trying to tackle this on our own, we began looking at other partners across the state and how we could collaborate and come together. And that really was the beginning of our new Missouri Lung Cancer Coalition. Um, we partnered with the American Lung Association of Missouri as co-chairs and really began recruiting a core team of a core group for our radon team, um, including other local nonprofits, stakeholders, cancer centers, public health departments, the universities, and other lung cancer advocates, and really developed a working structure for this team where we could begin to work together monthly to really assess what we needed to do and, and how to move forward. And we also built a, a partnership with our state employees and the radon department for Missouri to understand the challenges and the work that they had happening. And then we brought in experts from IEA and ARS National and our local Heartland chapter. Um, and that they've been a tremendous support to our team. And then we developed objectives for the team and we were really focused on two objectives, both around both awareness because there's a huge lack of awareness of the radon risks in Missouri and also on policy. So the radioactive radon reduction team really became our first um, team effort um, initiated by the Missouri Lung Cancer Coalition. Next slide, please. So I'm showing you this ARS, the IEA ARS report card for Missouri for two reasons. Um, this report card was very important to us in our outreach efforts because you'll see um, for Missouri, we have a high incidence of lung cancer um, induced from, from radon. We have one in three homes with high radon levels and we don't have any policy in place. Um, so we've used this report card on numerous occasions to speak to people about our work. But we also, in looking at this, showed that we had a lot of work to do, to do as a team to decide where to start um, because we couldn't tackle all of these policies at one time. So we had to focus in our efforts on where do we need to start first? Next slide, please. Sorry. So the first thing we did as a group is really looking at the landscape. We looked at our state challenges. Missouri has a very high incidence of lung cancer in the southeast region. Um, we have very few qualified radon professionals. Our qualified individuals are kind of centralized in the, in the metro areas. And we have a legislative environment that we could not build a heavy burden on the state. So we began to connect with the Missouri Cancer Consortium and our cancer control program and say, how do we work together to find a solution on where we need to go next? 
We also looked at data across the state. Our data was probably seven years old and we decided we needed to do some additional data validation. And we, we received a lot of data dumps and really validated that the, the test results that we were seeing for the state were accurate, but the more testing that was done, the higher percentages of homes we were seeing with high radon levels. We also looked at the percentage of homes over four picocuries versus the averages, and that showed us some interesting results. And then we did a lot of work around other state policies. Um, and we received a lot of help from National Association looking at what other states were doing. And from this, we decided we had to start as a team with, with certification and licensing of radon professionals. We felt like that was the groundwork we had to build so that we could support all these other policies because we don't have an extensive qualified workforce in our state. So we felt like we needed to do workforce development and build a qualified team. And then the last thing, two things we did there is we began building spreadsheets of who our supporters could be, who they would be, and that's an ongoing process, a working document for building out our supporter outreach. And then one of our most important documents were our stakeholder letters and what we call our why rationale statement document. And the next slide shows you just briefly, um, our why document is a two page document that we spent a lot of time working on this. Um, and we, we modeled what they were doing in other states with something similar and customized it to Missouri. But to really look at explaining quickly to someone what the risks are, why certification and licensing of professionals is necessary and, and the risks of not doing this. And then we also connected people to more detailed studies and resources so they could dig in a little bit further. But this gave them kind of a snapshot of what we were trying to do. So we use this and the IEA report card on a lot of our outreach. Next slide, please. So after we did kind of the assessment of where we were and where we needed to start, we began looking at how to develop a bill. Um, and we went through many revisions um, and we continued to resolve concerns that were addressed. Um, and we gained neutrality from the executive branch at the state. And that was important to us. We wanted, they couldn't be supporters of us, but they could participate and understand what we were trying to do. And we received a lot of input from IEA and, and industry experts to understand the areas that we were missing and needed to revise. And a big thing that we needed to determine is what state agency and, and statute should you be used to implement registration and licensing? We decided as a, as a group that we would, as we spoke about earlier in the, in the presentation, work with e EPA approved certification programs and have the state involved in registration and licensing. So we were, and, and we would use the organizations at the state that are already doing those processes. So we, we did a lot of work to develop that into our legislative proposal. And then lastly, we developed a fiscal note to show the cost to government and how we could pay for those costs through our licensing fees. And then in parallel to developing a proposal, understanding our landscape, we also recognize as a team that we need and we will continue to work on this, building awareness across Missouri. We've had several things going on over the last couple of years. We've had radon awareness webinars um, through the American Lung Association and our libraries and the University of Missouri and the Missouri Cancer Consortium. We conduct radon webinars every January um, and we plan to expand those. Um, for two years, we've been distributing radon awareness bookmarks to the libraries across the state. This past January, we distributed over nearly 30,000 radon awareness bookmarks. Um, we attend community events. We provide free radon test kits and radon awareness and information. And the Heartland chapter of IEA developed a case study with photos and descriptions of defective systems. And then we did a lot of, and we continue to do targeted social media advertising to residents in our state, because we need to build the momentum that people understand this risk. And so after we did all that work, just in December of this year, we entered uh, December of 2023, we introduced 
our legislature excuse me, we introduced our legislation. We planned a day at the Capitol, and this was done through our American Lung Association advocate that's a member of our team. She planned a plan a day at the Capitol. We identified an initial bill sponsor, and we submitted a draft bill for introduction. And we began to identify legislators to target based on the committees they were on, serving on. We, we identified people on key committees. We looked at legislators whose constituents were involved in our team, and we can, began conducting outreach to legislators to ask for meetings. Um, our advocate conducted training sessions with us. She developed talking points, and she put together leave behind packets. So our why document, the report card, the draft bill, um, all those things were left in, in folders with our legislators. And then she documented a follow-up process and ongoing work for us to continue to do that outreach. So this, our, our, our um, day at the Capitol was just in January, on January 30th. So we've been busy the last couple months. Next slide, please. And then this is just an example of some of the emails that we've been using as a team to push out, to request meetings and to do follow-up emails, meetings and follow-up. Next slide, please. And this is just some images from our day at the Capitol. We had a flyer. This is the team and the different team members that attended. And then you'll see in the right-hand corner, um, sponsor representative LaDonna Applebaum did file House Bill 2451, which is our initial licensing for the rate on industry professionals and businesses. So that was exciting. We have more work to do, but that was an exciting first step for us. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, um, we are really looking at staying focused on passage of the new licensing and certification bill, because we feel like that builds the groundwork for everything we need to do um, going forward with all the tenant protections and HUD housing and, and awareness legislation. We need a, we need a qualified workforce that's, that's, that's certified. Um, this will probably be a several, your effort, as Dan mentioned earlier, it's hard to get a bill through the first the first time in Missouri. So we will continue to push on licensing and certification. We will also continue to push on radon awareness through videos, events, and different things across the state so that we can really bring more awareness to this. It is amazing how many people are not aware of this level of risk. And then we're going to continue to strengthen and build new partnerships. As was discussed earlier by Dan, more, we need a bigger team that we can bring in more people and a bigger team of, from different organizations like those listed here that can begin to help us push this initiative forward. So these are our, our looking ahead in 2024 and the years ahead of, of our priorities. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to turn this back over now at this time to Jane. Thank you, Allison. Sure. So uh, next slide. Um, I think we've got oops. some. Sorry. Oh, you got to flip forward about 10 slides. Sorry. There was a version that had extra slides in it. Keep going. About six more slides. Thanks. Sorry. There. Thank you. Um, so you've just heard about uh, ways to get legislation passed. Very strong example of coalition building as well as the model for policies. Um, next slide, please. So just in wrapping up, um, you know, just leaving you with uh, one more piece of content. Um, you know, across all the policies described here and some others that we haven't described, you know, they're key elements. The model is to test and mitigate if the radon is above the EPA action level or four. Awareness notification of testing requirement not feasible but tenants must be permitted to escape the lease without financial penalty. Relevant standards must be followed. Certification, uh, including state credential, must be required for all work, although tenants must be permitted to screen their dwelling unit, the same as over owner occupants can do. All building types, all rate on zone, 10 years of all durations. There's no need to separate out different kinds of buildings um, or 10 years because uh, cumulative risk occurs as you move from one building to another and because um, the radon doesn't know building boundaries, it somehow is higher or lower in one building type or another. 
building wide and unit turnover triggers, they definitely involve different approaches. Obviously, a building wide strategy involves going through the whole building, but with the opportunity to mitigate the building once and for all at the ground level. Um, there should be an explicit testing schedule per the standards. Um, and also um, looking for these additional protections to first be enacted in the state where rate on work is regulated, as Allison mentioned. It's so important to have a a full full capacity, but also um, qualified capacity at, at in in an area, so that when a new protection is added, doesn't open up the floodgate for um, some uh, less than honest, less than scrupulous, or just less than competent person to come along and do that testing or that mitigation work. The mechanism for the rental protection policy may vary. It might be a local ordinance. It might be changing out the housing code. It might be state legislation or maybe something else. Um, and there are times when um, protecting tenants through law involves private right of action or code enforcement. Um, so mechanisms are going to vary, as we're saying, but um, it's important to try to get some of these elements in the policies to have this, the greatest protection possible. And next slide. Uh, on the slide, we have some uh, resources for you, um, some of which were mentioned earlier. Um, to to not the the papers that are visual vis, that you can visualize here, radar risk reduction strategies on rental housing on the left and indoor air quality and rental dwellings on the right. Those are uh, good resources available from the organizations with the websites listed above the names of the policies of excuse me of the papers. <laughs> In addition, on the um, the left hand side. We've got a QR code and a URL for the report card. Check out the report card for your state, and um, I, we believe it'll be a useful tool to you. And then on the lower right-hand side, we've got links to um, CDC's Data Explorer. They have a, a, a special uh, page now on the topic of read on testing, which puts all those resources in one place. It is a slightly longer slide, a slightly lower URL, but um, these slides will be made available later. Um, and then next slide. Um, so based on the information presented today, we want to know, we want you to think about how might addressing radon and rental housing align with your organization's current efforts? And who or what or is or are needed to advance protective policy in your state and your community? We hope we've left you with some good ideas for this and um, looking forward to talking with you in the future and helping you with them. Next slide. Um, so uh, this is the email addresses of all of the presenters should you want to contact someone individually. And um, again, we hope you think about your next steps. And so next slide is, I think, just the next question slide. Yeah, questions and answers. So with that, I'm going to uh, end the uh, presentation and we're going to open up. I think all, all the presenters are going to come back on camera and we're going to see what questions we have to be addressed. Thank you. All right, so um, may I ask Sarah or Tiffany, have you been monitoring the chat um, question and answer uh, log? Do we have some questions to raise? I don't see, see any anything. questions in the chat yet. I know we had several okay. questions submitted prior to the webinar, so we can start pulling from those as well. Um, but yeah, I encourage okay. everyone on the webinar to, um, as a reminder, you can submit questions in the Q&A box as we go. Okay, I'll, I'll raise some of the ones that were in the um, in the what was submitted. Um, how often do we have to test? Um, I think we haven't answered that question during this presentation yet. Who wants to cover that one for us? What based on the standards or Kyle? Sure, I can take that. So the recommendation in the standard is um, one time testing the property, all units at the property, um, one time every five years. If mitigation uh, is present at the property, then it would be one time every two years on the impacted units and one time every five years at all other units of the property. Right. Um, Daisy, this one's for you. Um, lessons learned challenges in complying with uh, Montgomery County's mandatory testing law. Did you want to say more about that? Thank you. So we haven't really seen any challenges with it. Um, I think the it has been rolling over quite nicely. We have not had or seen a shortage of certified professionals. 
Uh, we have been able to keep up with the time frames that the, the legislation has uh, set forth. So, so far, everything is going really well. Great. Um, another question uh, was, I have several tenants every year wanting to install do-it-yourself systems. Is there any guidance on this? I don't recommend this as a practice, but if they're going to do it, are there is there any guidance? I think one of our mitigator folks might take that. This is Dan. Um, it, it, you know, one of the phrases we have in the industry is simple systems are simple, but when it gets complicated, it gets very complicated. And you really don't know, really, unless you're a professional, what to look for to know if yours is a system that's going to become very complicated. So when they talk about it online, it's a pretty simple formula. And indeed, in some houses, it is. But um, I, I mean, I highly recommend against it because you don't know if yours is that house. Um, but if you're going to go ahead and do it anyway, there are some online um, topics that cover the really hard ones, but for the most part, that information is held mostly within the industry. And if you don't get in the industry, you, you won't know how to solve the problems that you run into. Agree with hey, that? Jane. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. Um, so just, you know, again, we're, we're talking about uh, landlord owned buildings. And one of one of the things that just you know, hit hit me uh, as a landlord is this is absolutely not a repair that I would feel comfortable with with my tenants um, doing on, on a building that I own. Um, one of the uh, reports that came back from Indiana uh, Indiana, as, as as this group uh, knows, implemented a uh, field uh, testing and compliance program uh, several years ago, and and a couple of the notes that that I recall from that report um, is there were two fires started um, on on some of these residential buildings. Um, so you're talking about electrical connectivity issues. You're talking about pouring into the, into the foundation, the home, potential structural issues. Um, it's just not something that as I'm investing in property, um, I would feel comfortable um, turning that over to, to a tenant, especially if you're talking about some of the more advanced structures, you know, 8, 10, 12, 20 plus um, unit buildings, you're, you're talking about um, a, a different degree of expertise than, than just a single family. But across the board, um, it would be an absolute no for me. Uh, another a, a similar kind of question. Um, I'm going to go. Hold on. Sorry. Um, it's from an inspector asking, "What protections do inspectors have if a tenant hires us to test for radon without the owner's knowledge? Do we have permission?" Um, so this is about testing, not about mitigation. Thoughts on that? Um, it's Kyle. Yep. So I, I would say that um, that is an issue uh, that, that's most likely going to fall under uh, state laws and regulations. Um, in, in some states, it's perfectly acceptable as a tenant to um, test your own home for just about anything uh, from, from a tenant standpoint. And in other states, uh, there are prohibitions uh, that, that would pre prevent that from happening. So you, you'll need to, to be aware of what you know, your own laws and regulations are for your own state. Okay. Uh, I want to comment. I see that some people have their hands up, and if you could please put your questions in the Q and A, uh, we'd really like to see it there. Um, we, we're not we're not able to turn on audio for everybody, unfortunately. Um, let's see. So we have a number of questions uh, in the that were submitted about funding, and um, I must say that this panel is not really prepared to have good answers today on funding. That's something that's, you know, a continuing conversation. Um, there are some uh, EPA funds available for indoor air issues this year. Um, we're hoping that people are putting together good community-based applications for that funding. Um, but the the hope and the theory here is that actually that the amortized cost, the cost of testing and mitigation over time uh, is is part of ordinary property upkeep and maintenance 
and that that is covered over time by the rental income. It's not, you know, it, it might be a point in time expense, but like other expenses, if, if, the, if the cash isn't there, uh, that that's borrowed funds might have to pay for that. Um, I know in an ideal world, we all like to see uh, an unlimited amount of money to pay for um, all rental properties to be mitigated that need it, but um, that's not really something we have access to at this point. Um, do we see any questions in the in the Q and A? And I'm sorry, people have your hands um, raised. Could you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. But I was going to say, Jane, one of the the questions that was submitted, kind of following up on what you were just sharing, um, that I thought was interesting, was um, someone saying that one of the challenges for securing grant money for radon mitigation systems is the ability to show impact in a short period of time. Um, you know, and kind of being able to report back to funders who may be looking for impact within like a year. Um, so yeah, are there any anything the panel could share in terms of evidence-based resources or other strategies for kind of communicating the need for, for radon mitigation and, and communicating about that kind of short-term versus long-term impact? I mean, I think the short-term impact is the same as the long-term. The, 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 the dwelling becomes below the action level Rate on level is hopefully more like 1.5 is, is the typical mitigator experience. And it stays that way and it's tested periodically according to the standards to make sure it stays that way. So it's the short term result is the same as the long term. Um, I hear it was so, another question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Dan. I was just going to mention that, you know, it, it, like a lot of landlord decisions, and I, I, I've been one myself, um, sometimes it's about uh, litigation avoidance, right? And and feeling like you're providing a safe environment for your tenants and you're avoiding potential litigation. This just falls under the, the list of asbestos and carbon monoxide and and things that you do. It's just been very late to the game uh, compared to a lot of these other environmental impacts. So I think that's how it's often view should be viewed. And then we had another question. Uh, can city, city staff be uh, qualified to do radon testing? And the answer to that is absolutely. In, um, in I know in some jurisdictions, there might even be an exemption for the license for government employees. But generally speaking, there'd be nothing better than to see, um, for example, code inspectors uh, who are qualified to test for radon and actually do it. That would be wonderful. Sarah, you got other questions? Um, yeah, so um, first I was just going to clarify um, as I was getting a couple of notes about it. Um, when we're talking about putting in the Q&A box, um, you'll notice that the chat is disabled for this webinar, but there should be a second function called Q&A that's located right up next to the chat box um, in your like Teams toolbar. So if you're looking for where to submit questions, you want the one called Q&A specifically, not just the chat, because you won't be able to use that. Um, a question that I had kind of building off of um, some what Allison talked about in your presentation, um, are there any strategies you all would recommend um, for kind of communicating about this issue if you're in an environment where there might be low levels of data available about the you know impact of radon in your community um, or if there's lower data quality or statistic data gaps or yeah any um, resources or strategies the panel could share on how to kind of tell that story if your your data that you're working with is not the greatest well, from our team's perspective, um, we looked at the data that was publicly available. And then we also worked with organizations to try to get more recent data by regions of test results that had been submitted through the state and others um, to try to combine and, and, and come up with, with new strategies to compare the data. It was difficult, um, but we, we, we found that you know, the data, there is a lot of published data out there at the state level, and Jane, you can speak to this better than I can, um, but through through ours in the state, there are different levels of, of data on radon levels. Where, where we got into some challenges is getting it down into the counties and the, the various counties. Um, but but those data numbers are available and, and we have some links to some of those. This is Dan. Um, and sometimes we changed 
the discussion style to, OK, maybe it is a small percentage. Mm -hmm. What's the acceptable amount of percentage of people that are you want to die from radioactive radon in this area? Uh, and again, as we often I will, we often use the word radioactive in front because people people get that. Right. They understand that they may not quite know what radon is, but when you talk about radioactivity, what percentage of houses is is an acceptable amount to expose people to radiation at a high level? It, 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 it's you know. So what if it's only two percent? That's still two percent too much well, to most people. And we found too, Dan, in the areas where there was low testing, the more the more we could get up to date information, we were able to show that as more testing was done, there were more high levels of radon. Sure. So we have a lot of rural counties where we had very limited data on testing. And so that's why we went through that exercise to try to get more data. And the more data we got, the higher the levels are <laughs> that we're showing. That makes sense. Yeah, and if I could if I could just add, Jane, um, this is Kyle. I think Allison hit it. Um, you, you typically find it once you go looking for it. So I, as an example, uh, Texas, if, if you look at uh, the map from, from the EPA uh, that dates back you know, several decades now, you would glance at Texas and think that there's not a radon problem in Texas, uh, when, when in fact I can tell you in, in um, HUD can verify that Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas is one of the most radon impacted uh, zip codes, uh, county uh, metropolitan areas that, that we look at. So don't let the map be the guide on whether to test or not, or even to characterize uh, a, a county for potential because each each building is, is different. And, and the other issue is just population density. So if, if you would look at uh, Atlanta or Los Angeles, you have tens of hundreds of thousands of people, even though maybe only five or seven percent of the buildings there are the units that, that are tested. It's just that you have a lot more of those units. So when you, when you look at large uh, metropolitan areas, you're going to have a lot of people exposed, um, even if it's at, um, you know, um, uh, several times less as a percentage, it's still a large volume of people. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry to go back to logistics, but um, I've, I've gotten information that the Q&A function isn't working. Apparently people submitted questions and um, we haven't seen them. So apologies to those who submitted questions. And for those of you who have your hands up, I don't think we have any way to bring you off um, mute. Um, so uh, I, let me just say this. We're going to keep the uh, webinar open for a little while longer, see if we get those questions going, and um, then we will, um, when, when we, basically, we're going to put together a follow-up for, for the webinar, send some information around to all of you who participated. Um, so I have one more question from the previous questions asked. Um, what information should be provided to tenants prior to, during, and after testing or mitigation is conducted specifically, are tenants responsible for maintaining the system? If it freezes in the in the winter, should they turn it off to not damage the fan? Who wants to take that one? I'm sorry, was the question, do you turn off the fan in the winter to, to avoid? Yes, yes. Are, are tenants so, responsible for maintaining the system? If it freezes, should you turn off? And the answer to that is no, but I wanted somebody to say right. more specifically. So we're, we're, in, give to we're in Chicago, so we have temperatures below zero for days in a row. Um, there are, in our environment and other cold environments, there are situations where the top of the discharge freezes across and becomes solid. Uh, at that point, it's the fan is not removing the radon. Uh, it will typically thaw in our environment two days after it hits uh, near freezing. So um, you, you don't don't forget you're pumping indoor air up against that ice, the bottom of the ice. So it doesn't have to be above freezing for it to thaw because it's getting this warm air blown against it. So it just has to be not significantly below uh, zero. 
Um, so it usually ends up a few days of radon exposure, which we know it doesn't really move the needle very much. It's like we use the analogy. It's like walking past someone who was smoking. Did you increase your odds of lung cancer? Yes, you did. How much? A teeny, 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 teeny amount, right? Um, and so they don't typically in that situation does not typically give an undue amount of stress to the fan. It is more stress than being open at the top, but it doesn't immediately wear out the fans. So the truth is the solution that's most cost effective is tends to be just wait. Uh, we can come out and thaw them, but we're not going to thaw them too many more days before they would have thawed naturally. Kyle, you do mitigation as well. Would, would yeah, that I, be I, similar to what you'd say? Yeah, I, I would just, um, from, from a broader context, I mean, this is a mechanical system. It's in a property that I'm renting. So I, I don't own, um, what I own is concern of, of making sure that things are functioning correctly. So just as if my, uh, my water heater goes out, I'm probably not going to go to Lowe's and replace the water heater um, and, and take that, that repair on. I'm not qualified to do that, nor is it my financial responsibility. I want to pick up the phone and I'm going to call my landlord. Um, if I have any questions about uh, the mitigation system, the operation of the system, hey, the, the, um, the alarm on the system um, is, is uh, causing me concern. Um, you know, there are folks that, that take care of that and it's not me. No, not as not as the so um, treat it as any other mechanical repair in, in a tenant occupied unit. Call your property manager, call your landlord, um, and make sure that they're using qualified professionals to to um, protect you. Thank you. Uh, so um, we will see if we could find those questions and answer them through another means in the future. Um, thanks to all who attended, and uh, please know that this the recording of this webinar will be available through the ILA website, the radon section, as well as uh, through the Indoor Environments Association ARST continuing education page. Um, so you'll be able to see this recording again if you'd like, and, and we will send that link out in case you want to share it with others, and there will also be a PDF of the slides. So thanks to everybody on the panel for your participation, including Sarah and Tiffany are off camera at the moment. Tiffany Belser at ALA organized us and got us started and showed the slides. Um, and um, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Take care.